Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another uh, History Workshop seminar where we will be hosting a online book launch for the book titled uh, Beyond Liberal Order, States, Societies and Markets in the Global Indian Ocean, uh, which is edited by Harry Farufen and Anatol Devan. Uh, so my name is Chris Bailings, and I will be uh, chairing the session with our very esteemed uh, presenters here today. And the order of proceedings that we that we will have is, firstly, uh, the, the book's editor, uh, Eri Farufen, will take us through the uh, arguments and themes, followed by uh, Thomas Blom Hansen and then Shandana Khan, Momand, and finally, our discussant, Andrew McDonald. Uh, and then we will open the floor for any questions that the audience might have, or any comments. Um, and also just to remind everyone that this session is being recorded and it will be uploaded to the History Workshop's uh, YouTube channel. Um, and yeah, just before we begin also, I just want to uh, remind the audience that uh, for your convenience, if you'd like to purchase the book, uh, there is a link in the comments uh, where you can also use the, the discount code, which is beyond 3030 and in all capitals, but it's all in the, the comments section. And if you, if you see in the comments, there's also some screenshots to help you uh, to, to show you where to put the, the discount code. Uh, so without further ado, I think we can get going with this with our first uh, speaker. Uh, by, by way of brief introduction, uh, we have Professor Harry Verhoeven, who teaches at the School of International and Public Affairs uh, of Columbia University. He is a senior research scholar at the Center of Global Energy Policy and senior advisor at the European Institute of Peace. He is the author of two monographs, Water, Civilization and Power in Sudan uh, and Why Comrades Go to War. He is also the editor of Environmental Politics in the Middle East, the local struggles, uh, global connections, uh, Marx and Lenin in Africa and Asia. Um, and water security in Africa in the age of global climate change. Thanks, Harry. Thanks so much, Chris. Thanks so much, Ariana and Jogo, for making this possible for us to, to be here all together, at least virtually uh, today. Thank you also to my good friend and important person, of course, at Vids, Mucha Musemwa, uh, for the kind initial invitation uh, to, uh, to set this up. I don't know if Mucha is able to attend in person here today. Um, but it's a great pleasure to be talking a bit about the edited volume that uh, was in the works for many years um, and to kind of briefly introduce to you some of its main themes, uh, some of the analytical vocabulary it uses to try to understand a very complex uh, macro region, but one that we argue um, is a very interesting entry point to better understand international relations, not only of the past, but also arguably of the present and the future. So what I'll do perhaps to, to help with that conversation is briefly uh, share my, my, my presentation here um, I hope you can all see this, um, which, as I said, will set out the main contours and arguments of the book before my, my colleague Shandana and Thomas uh, will flesh out their, their, their respective contributions, their respective chapters in the, in the, in the volume. Um, now, we need a starting point at an intellectual level for, for our inquiry and for bringing together a, a group of scholars, anthropologists, historians, political scientists, economists, scholars of international relations is really that of all the world's macro regions, the world of the Indian Ocean is by far the most diverse and unpredictable one. Um, it's a region that's home to the greatest 
range of different cultural, religious, and linguistic traditions. It's a part of the world where over the last 30, 35 years, uh, we've seen the most rapid population growth, as well as the most rapid economic growth in quite a few important states along the oceanic rim. It's also a part of the world um, where we already see the impacts of climatic changes hitting hardest, and where, of course, some of the societies along the oceanic rim are some of the least, the most vulnerable and least capable of responding and adapting dynamically to them. And it's also part of the world, of course, where the, the politics are extraordinarily volatile and diverse, um, with a range of polities all the way from very successful and hyper-efficient city-states like Singapore and Dubai, to very old kind of imperial states with a very deep tradition like Iran and Thailand, to uh, relatively uh, cacophonous, noisy, perhaps even chaotic democratic systems or aspiring democracies in the forms of, of India and Bangladesh and, and Kenya, to of course the contemporary state fragmentation we see in places like Yemen and, and Somalia. And it is this highly dynamic, uh, yet highly unpredictable and heterogeneous character of the region, which is not just a function of contemporary circumstances, but that we see over much longer time horizons that we really wanted to try to understand in the book. And we do so in large part out of a, a deep discontent with the dominant ways really of thinking about international order and the place of the world of the Indian Ocean um, within it. Now, for those of you who are not uh, scholars or, or kind of IR theorists, scholars of international relations, let me perhaps briefly explain what we mean by this. Um, you know, one of the most influential ways of thinking about international relations and the structure of the international system in the last 30, 40 years has really been this idea of a liberal international order. And scholars and policymakers working in this vein traditionally propose that liberal international order is like previous international orders, one that very clearly identifies a number of states as deeply influential in shaping interactions between different parts of the international system, but that there is something fundamentally different about the international system that we live in today, essentially since 1945, and especially since 1989. And this is perhaps best elucidated by the difference between so-called primacy and hegemony. Now, according to theorists of liberal international order, past international orders, whether that of the of the Roman Empire or, for example, the uh, hugely huge influence of the Chinese Empire in its part of the world or the Dutch in the 17th century, was really characterized above all by primacy. That is to say, a kind of material preponderance, a material economic, political, military preponderance that allowed these respective polities to impose on their neighborhood and sometimes parts of the world further afield, a set of rules and a set of interactions, whether they liked it or not. The argument about liberal international order is, is that it's far more hegemonic. That is to say that there is a consensual and persuasive element about it that also includes a constant process of, of negotiation and hegemon deliberately binding itself to certain rules and certain agreements that renders this, this, this order uniquely legitimate. And the words of perhaps the, the greatest theoretician of this, this approach, John, John Eikenberry, um, it has also been, it has been uniquely successful in terms of the provision of security, in terms of wealth creation, of social advancement, more than any other order in, in the world history. Now, importantly, in this kind of self-image of liberal international order, there is the assumption, too, that there is not just a liberal international construction, but that this is fundamentally premised on the different constituent units, the different states, economies, societies that make up this international order, reflecting the very same values as the international order. So there's a kind of, if you like, mirroring effect and self-reinforcing effect where um, the very fact that you have a growing number of, of liberal democracies or supposedly liberal states in different parts of the world translates into greater strength for liberal international order, which in turn makes it more likely that states will voluntarily choose to join this order, sign free trade agreements, democratize, uh, join various other international organizations in the same spirit of liberal international order. Now, even by the account of those who are proponents of this, of this frame, uh, the world of the Indian Ocean is very, is very much an afterthought. At best, in many cases, it's a, it's a footnote to the extent that it's common to Dobon at all. And now, this is, of course, profoundly problematic, not only at an ethical level, but even at a and at the little, little level, when you leave about 3 billion, perhaps 3.5 billion people who live in the states either around the Indian Ocean or in states immediately adjacent to the oceanic rim, uh, 
when you leave this out of the out of out of the picture and out of the out of the narrative that you seek to portray as to how um, our international society today actually works. Um, and so what we try to do in the book is to try to borrow Lee from from global history. And rather than focusing on individual states or on continents, on territories, on land masses, as is traditionally um, the approach that informs thinking about international order, we do so from the standpoint of oceans. And we try to not only think of oceans as these kind of great connecting forces that throughout history, of course, have allowed different civilizations and societies and markets to exchange ideas, sometimes voluntarily, sometimes uh, less so. But it immediately also highlights a very different context than that of the North Atlantic and East Asia, which is above all what theorists of liberal international order have in mind when they talk about this, about this subject. Uh, in the North Atlantic and the East Asia, in East Asia, you do indeed have a superpower that is present, that historically has generated a number of public goods and it has sought to institutionalize its military dominance with like NATO or the US the Japan defense agreement uh, economically through very deep trade and investment ties that have been institutionalized and codified in institutions like the World Trade Organization. And of course, politically, in terms of encouraging a parliamentary democracy and various types of republics uh, in uh, East Asia and indeed in the North Atlantic. In the world of the Indian Ocean, there is no such thing. There is no such degree of institutionalization, no equivalence of the EU, of NATO, of NAFTA, of the US uh, Japan defense agreement that is present at all. Um, and this is important because, it, as I said, it, it, it alerts us to this fact that the nature of hegemony, to the extent that it is important and consequential, is very different in this part of the world. And this dovetails, of course, with a very long-standing and very deep critique, uh, and especially has come from the humanities, especially from, from history, that has long sought to portray the Indian Ocean as fundamentally different. Um, it's often a very rude um, literature that often risks romanticizing the Indian Ocean, which shows it which argues that it's fundamentally more fluid, less colonized, perhaps also less tainted, if you like, by liberal order than other parts of the world, and, and which very strongly uh, highlights the difference uh, of this region compared to others. Now, in the book, we try to go beyond, um, you know, either seeing this region, as I said, as a as somehow being being determined by liberal international order, but nor do we seek to say that it is fundamentally different in every single way that liberal international order doesn't matter to understand. What we argue is that, you know, it is worth trying to think of liberal order in the Indian Ocean world as an encounter, as a colliding of worlds and of different social and political and economic registries that has generated a complex set of synergies, antagonisms and parallel realities in which liberal order is very consequential and has proven very useful for different actors in this, in this space at some moments in time and has been much more resisted, mediated, rejected, ignored in, some, in other uh, uh, fields of, uh, of social, political, and economic life. And we try to coin this you know, as the as so-called global Indian Ocean, both highlighting the importance of the Indian Ocean region over long periods of time to processes of globalization and global order, but also trying to understand how these global forces that are important around the world, of course, uh, may have different effects uh, in, this, in, this, in this space. And we're particularly uh, trying to think through the, the consequences of using this idea of, of what I've called in my, in my introductory chapter, thin hegemony, this idea that we do have an international system that is hierarchical in which there is a hegemon. But in the case of the Indian Ocean, where the constituent parts are actually relatively autonomous, they interact a lot with each other, but they by and large do so in consensual fashion. And neither their values nor their interests necessarily always converge with one of the hegemon, who, as I said, provides only a, a very limited set of, of public goods and only to a very limited extent is able to get these constituent parts to assimilate um, to it. And in the process, you know, the argument we put forward is that this presumed periphery of liberal international order in many ways is as revealing of the logics and contradictions of liberal order as the very core. Um, for example, in order to understand the influence of, of the idea of development or the global war on terror or uh, many articulations of human rights that are so important to the contemporary liberal order, it might be as valuable, as instrumental, as interesting to look at the ways in which this is manifested again, resisted and, and mediated by different actors uh, in this space uh, as it is in the very core of the international system in the in the North Atlantic. And for example, my, my colleague Shandana will talk in just a minute about democracy and democratization 
uh, in this in this space will will I think bring this out uh, will bring this out very very poignantly. Um, what this really then means, as I said, is um, when we try to think of the Indian Ocean this, in, in this way, and we try to understand liberal order, as I said, as this, as this, as this meeting point, as this encounter, um, is that it highlights, of course, the enduring uh, pluriformity, again, of political, economic, and social systems. What is remarkable about the Indian Ocean is that it highlights the staying power of extraordinary levels of diversity, of extraordinary levels of ethno and political segmentation um, that are all, that in many cases have proven uh, to outlast uh, many of the predictions um, of outsiders who, who've come in and often assumed, as I said, that over time there would be a much greater convergence uh, with the strongest powers in the, in the international systems and their ideas about interests and uh, about, about values. That's what the book really tries to do, to try to think, as I said, about this, about this encounter in, in many different ways. Um, we've got a range of chapters dealing with military issues, political issues, social issues, economic issues throughout time and throughout space, sometimes focusing on individual countries, sometimes focusing on, on, on different regions. And again, time and again, it tries to bring out the, the specificity of this region. To give one example uh, by way of, of conclusion, uh, we have two, I think, absolutely stellar chapters in the book, one about Singapore and one about uh, the Gulf states. And both of them are very are very different, but also very very interesting. And both of them, in many ways, are the very product of what liberal order has been able to offer them. That is to say, a significant degree of capital mobility, um, protection by the U.S. Navy, um, I mean, guaranteed uh, lines of energy production and, and consumption. The idea of, of energy security, as provided by liberal international order, is very very important to them. But at the same time, of course, that have used uh, many of these features of liberal international order to, to further their very own ambitions. Domestically, these are not states that are in any shape or form converging on some kind of Washington consensus or some kind of idea of Scandinavian social democracy. These are states in which many of the precepts of liberal order, whether it's, it's property rights or the ideas of how you organize your citizenries, um, the idea of even organizing your political system are very routinely flouted. And again, in the book, we try to, therefore, try to strike this balance of pointing out where it is significant and consequential and where it is uh, less so. But enough uh, for me for now. Uh, thanks so much in any case, um, again, for, for the interest and for the invitation. Let me hand it over to my colleague Shanna to tell you a little bit more about what democracy and democratization may look like in this, uh, in this space. But thanks so much. Thanks, Harry, but I think it goes to Thomas next. I think that's what they'd Oh, suggest. Thomas next, sorry. Of course, yes, it, it does. My apologies. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks, Harry. Um, yeah, indeed, it is Thomas next. Uh, and uh, Thomas Hansen is the Reliance uh, Dirubai Ambani prof Professor of Anthropology. He founded and directed Stanford Center for South Asia from 2010 to 2017. Hansen is an anthropologist of political life, ethno-religious identities, violence, and urban life in South Asia and Southern Africa. He has multiple theoretical and disciplinary interests from political theory and continental philosophy to psychoanalysis, comparative religion, and contemporary urbanism, much of Professor Hansen's early fieldwork was done during the tumultuous and tense years in the beginning of the 1990s when conflicts between Hindu militants and Muslims defined national agendas and produced frequent violent clashes in the streets. Out of his work came two books, The Saffron Wave, Democracy and Hindu Nationalism in Modern India, which explores the larger phenomenon of Hindu nationalism in the light of the uh, dynamics of India's democratic experience. And secondly, uh, wages of violence, naming an identity in post-colonial Bombay, wherein this explores the historical processes and identity formations that gave rise to the violence, to the violent socio-religious conflict and the renaming of the city in 1995. Um, yeah. Thanks. Over to you, Thomas. Well, thank you very much for that introduction and thank you for uh, organizing this event and, and doing this sort of uh, uh, launch for, for the book that, as Harry said, has been 
in, in the works for a long time. I think we began with a conference in Doha in 2007, no, 16, I want to say, a um, long time ago. Um, so my contribution to this book, and I'm going to share my screen uh, here. I hope you can see that. Uh, I will just make sure it's on full. Yeah. All right. So my uh, uh, chapter is a kind of long, I'm an anthropologist, but I'm, I'm sort of uh, uh, dabbling in, in long histories here and looking at some of the work I've done um, uh, over the many years, both in India and South Africa, in view of a kind of long prehistory of the Indian Ocean. In some ways, I'm my argument is about how did it come to be that the global Indian Ocean is even imaginable as a, as a region in itself, right? And and of course there are lots of um, lots of interactions and lots of uh, trade and lots of uh, distribution of people throughout this region for many many centuries prior to uh, European colonialism. But it's really with colonialism that a new order that is that sets a new order and, and sets the stage for a lot of the things that we see today um, it arrives and emerges. And that's what my chapter really is about. I, I try to trace sort of the long couple of centuries um, prehistory of a lot of the stuff I, I have worked on. So um, uh, I want to uh, just talk a little bit about um, the way in which the Indian Ocean uh, uh, really became the crucible of trade in the, of course, there was the Atlantic uh, trade, uh, but that was mainly also the building of the slave trade and the building of economies in the new world. But the sort of classical, the the, the, the big price, as it were, in, in the global trade as it emerged in the uh, centuries after 1500s was, was really the Indian Ocean. And this is a space of competition. This is a space of conflict. It's a space of profound violence, uh, but not really a space of effective colonization uh, in any way until around um, the end of the 18th century. And uh, uh, you can see here, uh, uh, there is a, you know, the, the intensity of trading from, from Europe, uh, and you can see a lot of it is really focused on uh, the Indian subcontinent that becomes a sort of crucible or becomes a sort of, uh, a place that that comes to be uh, uh, be a sort of subcenter, you can say, for lots of um, uh, uh, trade and lots of political projects and, and and forms of contestation and domination in in um, the Indian Ocean over the next uh, couple of hundred years. And with with the uh, uh, coming of the the rise of the British Empire, this is where people talk about. This is how uh, 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 the Indian Ocean becomes a British. Um, uh, a side of British domination, and and my my argument on this, um, and I'm, I apologize. Some of the slides are a little bit grainy. I can see that I've probably blown them up a little bit too much. But when you look at how the British established their um, domination uh, uh, in the Indian Ocean, it's actually a very interesting story that goes completely against the way in which we often think of the history of sovereignty in the world, where many scholars begin with the Westphalian peace in Europe, and then there was a territorialization of states and an ever more firming up of boundaries and even the law of the seas come into being with Grotius and others. What, what the Indian Ocean shows us is actually a, a very contradictory patchwork of many different kinds of rule and many different kinds of um, arrangements, some of which, I mean, the, clearly the, the British Navy and the, uh, and the British Empire became the dominant player, but the Dutch were there, the Portuguese were there, and so on and so forth. So it's a very um, complex thing, and I call that distributed sovereignty because it's not really a British sovereignty in a classical sense. It's a form of a configuration of domination and understandings and treaties and so on that actually puts many dis discrepant forms of rule and many discrepant forms of legitimacy together in a sort of loose confeder uh, confederation, you might say, a loose network of, of domination that, the, that especially the, the British uh, Empire is able to build up. And uh, uh, I, uh, so, so for me, the, 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 key, the, the key term is really the distribution, that is that 
that uh, the way the British Empire worked was less as we often imagine it as a kind of direct uh, colonial, uh, direct territorial domination, but actually worked through all kinds of agencies, all kinds of treaties, all kinds of middle uh, 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 men and, and uh, forms of delegated or independent autonomous power that was kind of assembled constantly. And this was a, a labor where India played a, a significant role, and I, I come to this in a second. Um, one of the, as I said, if you go back, you can see here the green on the map is just sort of marking out of the, the um, princely states of India, which actually played a major role in Indian history, not always uh, so highlighted these days. Um, but one of the things that they did, these were independent, these were Normally independent states, but they had their own administration, whatever, but they were on, under the paramountcy of, of the British Empire. And um, they became, uh, in many ways, very important to the expansion across the Indian Ocean, especially those on the western side. And if uh, here is a, a picture of Gujarat, as you know, Gujarat today is one of the sort of engines of economic growth in India. And, and what the prehistory of that is, in fact, that Gujarat was the state of the area in India that had the most um, uh, of these uh, independent uh, or quasi-independent sovereigns. They had their own currency. Here we have a, a note from what one state. These were very small states, many of them. They were driven by the, the, both, both land. They had uh, uh, landed interests, but a, a lot of it was built on a kind of radical expansion of the um, oceanic trade. So many of the communities and, and many of the rulers were actually propped up by the riches that were enabled by these uh, trading communities that had been in Gujarat for a long time, but now on the back of um, British expansion across the Indian Ocean were able to expand and to become truly uh, global players and, and, and international um, transnational communities with very significant uh, economic clout. Uh, and that's a pattern that continues today. Many of the richest uh, communities in India and in Pakistan today were actually the communities that were able to accumulate and, and uh, very significant amounts of capital and, and uh, social capital during the, the era of the late empire. One example, and this is what I do in the book, I talk about the Mamans, uh, the most, most wealthy and influential uh, of, uh, of the Muslim communities uh, in, in South Africa today. They uh, came out of Gujarat from a small town called Port Bandar. Uh, and they had the most spectacular success in, in Durban um, and Johannesburg, and they built all the, the most of the big mosques you see today in Durban and also elsewhere have been sponsored by Mamans, a very large number of them. They're also famous for hiring a, a young man called Mohandas Gandhi as their lawyer, as they were fighting property disputes with the white um, capital interest in Durban. Um, and they, they were constantly uh, in, in contact with what happened back in India. So for them, the Indian Ocean was, uh, was, was not really a barrier, it was that, that uh, enabler that, that made the rise of the community into this very significant economic player possible. And there's one example I mentioned in my chapter, which is a kind of long-standing dispute over uh, access to, to a, a mosque space and something that's been documented by South African, uh, our colleague from South Africa, Gulam Wahid, um, and who shows that the, 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 the ruler of Porbanda was actively uh, involved in, 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 in sort of uh, solving or addressing this dispute that arose in Durban many, many thousands of miles away. And it, sort of, it calls into question some of our ideas of how sovereignty arrangements actually worked in the Indian Ocean, but also the kinds of social connections it enabled. The other example I have is one that's more familiar in the literature, especially something I, of course, that the communities I worked on in uh, Durban um, in the early 2000s, and, and, and where South Africa became the biggest uh, uh, destination for um, export of labor from India as indentured laborers. And this, uh, uh, these are the uh, uh, out-migration zones, and here are some of the pictures, this is all well-known stuff. And here are one of the, the, the boats that arrive as with the so-called coolies, as they were known in a, with the derogatory term at the time. Now, my point with that example is to show 
a very different kind of configuration where the, uh, the, the, the British Empire enabled this system of indenture to come after uh, slavery was abolished in 1833. There was a great need for, for labor. And, and this became set up as a, as a kind of, uh, as Hugh Tinker, the, the, the historian of this uh, par excellence calls the new system of slavery. But within the system of, loose system of uh, the British empire, one thing that became very clear was that as the meanings of sovereignty uh, also began to change in the world generally uh, uh, from having been primarily focused on the focus on, on on territory and territorial domination the question of what to do with with sovereignty over people became paramount and the, the in some ways the indentured laborers landed right in this and there were protect protracted conflicts between the colonial government of India and the colonial government of South Africa about who was to care about the indentured laborers, not just in South Africa, but elsewhere in South Africa, it took a particularly sort of, um, uh, 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 you can say the conflict got, got very deep and, and actually led to uh, all kinds of initiatives to protect the interest and the welfare and the health uh, and the education uh, and so on uh, of um, uh, indentured laborers. And these were initiatives that were launched by the colonial government of India uh, 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 you know, in, in a kind of very tense relationship with the colonial government of, of South Africa. So you can see here that in some ways uh, the, 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 the Indian Ocean allows both for this kind of loose and almost like a delegated or kind of semi-autonomous world of the Memons that had their own forms of governance. And here you have these last vast uh, millions of people who are being moved around and whose welfare and livelihood then become a concern for, for a, a new kind of paradigm of rule that, that arises in the 20th century and the late 19th century worldwide, right? And, and that, that uh, creates these all these contradictory effects. Um, the last example I have is really the, 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 the history of migration from Western India, uh, both from Gujarat, but also from Bombay over to the uh, Indian, uh, to the Persian Gulf. And that's, a, a traffic that begins in the 19th century where Indian merchants, uh, uh, but also workers went to the Gulf. So what we see today in the Gulf, a very substantial number of South Asians uh, working uh, Pakistanis, Indians, Bangladeshis and others, Filipinos also in the Gulf is actually has a long free history. And one of the aspects of that is that many of the people who were residents and, and actually were the uh, sort of representatives of empire in the Gulf were not British. They were actually Gujarati traders who were uh, uh, who were uh, invested with the power and authority by the uh, uh, government of Delhi to represent um, uh, the Majesty, Her Majesty's government in the East, as it was known at the time. Right. So their position and their deep connections uh, 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 give us a, a, a lot of um, uh, uh, sort of perspective on how how. Um, complicated that relation is and how deep and how, in a sense, path dependent some of the relationships between the Indian subcontinent and the Persian Gulf is. One example is, for instance, the big debate and, and conflicts over what to do with Hajj pilgrims that went from South Asia, went to, to uh, Mecca. Um, and, and these were, again, uh, uh, where you had thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who went and there were these disputes over who should care for them, who should take care of them. This is not something that is over. We know that this is something that Saudi authorities is grappling with and dealing with. But this was also on the plate um, of, of um, the British Empire in the late uh, 19th century, where it, had, it tried to set itself up as the protector of all Muslims in, in the Indian Ocean. Um, and, and later on, uh, uh, this becomes a sort of larger uh, 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 labor migration and, and sort of external economy, you can say, that plays a very massive role in Bombay and, and leads to, um, in a sense, a, uh, uh, and, and, and feeds into longstanding suspicions and longstanding um, uh, conflicts between Hindus and Muslims and longstanding allegations that Muslims in Bombay and other parts of Western India are not loyal to India, that they are independent from the economy and so on and so forth. And this whole 
uh, idea that they all that Indian Muslims, and especially Bombay Muslims, are particularly criminalized, and 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 the whole sort of mythology of of um, of uh, 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 the sort of the mafia, the, the Bombay mafia, and so on and so forth. So all of that, when you look at the prehistory, comes into view as something that is uh, that is actually uh, it, I wouldn't say predictable, but it certainly has very deep and long roots. And all of it has to do with the fact that the Indian Ocean has played a key role in the emergence of these conflicts, but also some of these communities, the way we see it today. So that's the, the long uh, afterlife. We live in the long afterlife of this peculiar system of distributed sovereignty that was set up during British rule. And many of the conflicts, including conflicts over who belongs, what kind of rights can South Asians have in the Gulf, what kind of rights are, are Indian South Africans really loyal to South Africa, or the, the conflicts between the, the, the question marks around the place of Indians in Malaysia or many other places. A lot of that has direct links back in to, to the forms of, of, of complicated relationships and complicated distributions of authority and sovereignty that were set up um, uh, during the late empire. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Thomas. Uh, so next up we have Shandana Khan Omand who is a social scientist whose main area of research is inequality and inclusive politics. She leads the IDS uh, Governance Research Cluster and the IDS Pakistan Hub. She is the author of Crafty Oligarchs, Savvy Voters, Democracy Under Inequality in Rural Pakistan, and a number of other journal articles and book chapters. She is also on the editorial board of the Modern South Asia series of Oxford University, an associate fellow at the Institute of Development and Economic Alternatives, and a fellow at the Mabub al ul Haq Research Center at the Lahore University of Management Sciences. Thank you, Shanda. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I had to run through all of that, but thank you for the for the introduction. I'm going to share my screen, and while that's loading, just to um, just to say that this continues actually really well from from what Thomas has, has just spoken about, um, and essentially continues that question around. How, how do we take the dynamics that Harry set out, that Thomas has talked about in terms of what happened in this region, especially with British colonialism, and how do we use that to make sense of the politics that we see in this area? Um, so even though uh, this draws on the idea um, on, on politics in Pakistan, but I think it sits quite well with the South African context for sure. But it's it's not to suggest that this is the form of politics that we should expect to see around this ocean. As Harry pointed out, this is a very complex geopolitical um, region. And to expect that we can very easily sort of bring together, you know, what the dynamics have been across large parts of this is clearly difficult. But the attempt here has been to say there are certain conditions that we can identify. And as long as those conditions hold in, in parts of this um, the region, then we can expect to see a certain kind of politics. And that's essentially what I'm trying to get at in this chapter. So it continues on from what Thomas uh, talked about in terms of the colonial impact, but it, it takes it down to sort of very current day um, politics and also to a very local level of politics. So the chapter in the book is essentially on what I'm calling hybrid clientelism and the practice of hybrid clientelism as a form of democracy in the global Indian um, Ocean. And um, so it, it picks up on um, that, that, that history of colonial rule and the particular aspects of colonial rule that I want to speak to, uh, that I'm trying to speak to in this chapter are those of um, post-colonial reproduction of the types of bureaucracies and the extractive bureaucracies that were set up under colonial rule, which was which which had a very particular way of dealing with rural populations, uh, with rural areas, and the the production of resources. But essentially, the sort of a rural economy, but also urban economy, and through that, the process of elite capture. So populations that became closer to colonial rule and benefited from that process much more than did other 
other um, countries. So that's one part of the social context that I think we can cite in different parts of this region. Another part of that, of social framing and, and commonality perhaps a, a, across this region, is that there has been extensive socioeconomic change since the end of colonialism, clearly. But what we also have is that socioeconomic inequality has remained incredibly high. Um, so um, along with economic change, um, you also have ethnic segmentation, a real separation between different population groups. And this is uh, this is this is sort of what we can think of as very immobile social categories, categories that that stick and allow uh, and, and restrict movement um, upwards across I mean the, that become immutable and that then and they're not immutable um, uh, sort of it's it's they're, they're immutable because the processes of state formation in the region have have built off these cleavages rather than challenged them so we've taken what was handed um, the we've taken the dynamics that were created during colonial rule and we've continued to reproduce them in a fashion and and allowed those cleavages to define a large part of the politics in these areas so that's a little part about uh, a little bit of the social framing um that that uh, i start with within the chapter but then there's a very particular political framing, which is around this idea that a lot of the countries in this region have been described as patronage democracies, and about the fact that it's really sort of um, the politics that is defined by ethnic political parties, and it's led by this logic of ethnic politics or the politics of clientelism. At the same time, something I've alluded to just above that is that there has been extensive socioeconomic change during this time. So the literature will tell us that if you see industrialization, if you see a large up, uh, sort of incredible levels of urbanization in some parts of this uh, region, increasing incomes as well as rising inequality, all of this makes practices such as clientelism, specifically vote buying within um, clientelism, less attractive. So we should really be in a phase when we're not talking about patronage democracies, because what happens instead is that ideological, populist, programmatic policy positions become much more attractive to voters through this process of change. At the same time, literature also tells us that sort of the, the expanse of democratic politics, the, 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 the creation of those, these more democratic relationships also make monitoring of clientelistic relationships that were very much sort of based within uh, villages and more personalistic relationships much harder to monitor. So that it's very difficult to continue to speak about these countries as, as patronage democracies, but the literature doesn't move away from it very much, leaving us with this question of whether we should still be talking about clientelism when we discuss the politics of this region. And um, again, literature is divided on that. There is a very strong yes that we get from, um, from various studies that have been done that, that admit that there are more vibrant political um, pr um, practices that are more democratic in nature now. But while all of this is expanding, clientelistic practices also remain strong within them. In fact, a lot of the politics, a lot of the vibrant democratic politics we see have found ways to incorporate clientelistic practices. At the same time, there's studies, including some of my own, which is the last one listed here, that tells us that if you move from rural to urban areas, then there is less and less clientelism that's visible and far more, more ideological more so populist party politics um, that's that's becoming very visible. So the question that I'm essentially then asking in this in 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 this book is to is to sort of figure the, or rather the theory that I'm advancing in this book is to say that what the way to sort of reconcile these two very different viewpoints is to uh, is to talk about um, a hybrid clientelism that draws on two very different varieties of clientelism and putting it really briefly um, is, is to say that the first type of cli um, clientelism is that of mass parties that produces party machines that then have large networks of brokers that pass information from voters up to parties and then uh, help parties decide what voters are demanding. This is your classic example of party networks and machines and that's what we see in large parts uh, across uh, large parts of this region. 
At the same time, however, given that socioeconomic uh, inequality and the immutable social categories that I talked about, a differentiation that I talked about on the earlier slide, we also have the more traditional older form of clientelism of notables that continues, which is still built around very personalistic networks. And this again has been recorded by a number of studies, which provides not, which produces not party machines, but actually modular parties that are modularly assembled around the power of local notables um, and that lack and that therefore mean that political parties in this region may lack strong internal structures and stable constituencies because it's these local um, bigwigs um, that that handle so much that that retain so much of the power and of the uh, power to organize um, the vote. So the interactions between that colonial sort of structure, as well as the modernization that we've sort of um, seen, the changes, the urbanization that we've sort of seen in this, they interact to create this kind of a hybrid in which we are now seeing the two varieties of clientelism coexist. So your brokers of the party machines may be local notables um, because of the structure of, of inequality, socioeconomic inequality, that voters value these notables as much for their personal power as they do for the access that they provide to party networks. And that parties, in fact, know how to differentiate these markets. So a party that is modular in rural areas may very well function as a machine in urban areas. So there is no reason to have to choose one over the other but that may be what we're really seeing is this hybrid clientelism. And that essentially is the theory that the, that the chapter advances. And it's and it takes it's, it's based essentially around um, the, the questions that this then leads us to is to ask what is actually happening then at the local level. If, this, if these are the conditions that are obtained by these interactions, then what is it that we see? at the local level, what is the kind of micro dynamic that is created during an election in these areas? How does this interaction, this hybridity of clientelism actually function? And to what extent does the unequal status of voters, given their immutable social categories within their communities interact with the empowerment that is offered by the vote. And that's a very central part of this is that the real changing factor in all of this is the coming of an election and the coming of a regular election and the extent to which that election is able to empower the poorest through their vote. Um, again, the number of studies have talked about that earlier, but this is certainly something I find in my own work is that even through that illiberal order of notables, a lot starts to shift with the simple coming of an election and the simple holding of an election. So so to answer these questions, I actually trace what happens between two elections um, across across a, a sort of period of 2006 to 2013. The elections were in 2008 and in 2013, which I directly observed. I do a comparative study um, and the details of all of this are in the chapter across four villages. And the reason for the selection of these four villages is completely connected to colonial history. So what you have in these villages, which are listed on the spectrum at the at, um, at the bottom uh, of this slide is that in a village to the extreme right, such as Tivanabad, you have Tivan, both Tivanabad and Sahiwal were settled under colonial rule as what they call proprietary estates, i.e. all of the land, all of the economic power, all social authority was settled on a single individual or a family. And over time, even though that has diffused as families multiply, it remains within the family. And in very few cases do we really see that changing very much. But there are almost next door to these villages, villages where that don't function like that at all. And the real differentiating factor is the fact that land was settled differently during colonial times in these villages. So here, instead of giving it all to uh, all the land to one owner, A, the state did not transfer land and instead created what we people who leased land from, from the state and never quite became owners. But also then there were many um, numbers of landowners through that, a much larger group of landowners, often a sim uh, one ethnic group, but in some villages, not even a single ethnic group. So a real diffusion, not just of economic power, but within it, social authority. So that in villages like Tivanabad and Sahiwal, you have a social authority that is almost sort of palpable even now that rests with a very small group of people right at the top. In the case of Tivanabad, still with a single person. And if you go down the spectrum towards what I, the village that I call Chak 2, um, there's almost nobody that you'd be able to 
identify as this, this sort of uh, group that holds on to power. But the important part in all of this is these villages are very close to one another. They sit in the same district. And the difference between them is really that settlement under colonial periods. And it's that, it's that settling of land 100 years ago that still determines differences that we see in these villages in politics um, right now. So I'll cut um, the, the story sort of short here, but essentially over this period of observing two elections in these villages um, and defining sort of different uh, variables of uh, measures of what I call democratization, um, thinking about it as it usually is as an amalgamation of contestation and inclusion, and then thinking about whether or not local politics was becoming more uh, inclusive or not, and whether there were new challenges to power, essentially what um, the, the, the final results across these villages is that overall, there is definitely a greater likelihood in the villages on the left of the spectrum than on the right of the spectrum of being more democratic. So very connected. Um, and I run this sort of uh, at, at a larger stage. I also run this across a larger number of villages. But essentially, it is almost all explained by how you were settled under colonial rule and the impact of colonial land settlements. And then, of course, all of the reproduction of, of power since then. But essentially, what you get is a whole lot more democratization, even 100 years Years later in the villages on the left compared to the right and that and but but changes have happened but where they've happened is in terms of making politics more inclusive which is partly good news but with power still sitting with the same set of elites at the top so there are not greater spaces for contestation power power politics is fairly still uh, limited to to lying in a, in a in the hands of a few people but the coming of an election and the need for a vote means that you're far more inclusive now, tend to be far more inclusive now than you would have been um, earlier. Um, I just want to sort of end with just talking a little bit about what the implications of this are. There's a few um, implications for this. Um, is, is the fact that like I said, contestation may not have in, in, increased, even though there is greater contestation at the national level. That socioeconomic inequality at the low, uh, within villages still means that contest, spaces for contestation are limited and largely elite controlled. But that inclusion has increased, and as has the language that um, people use of the of, of accountability and responsiveness, even under conditions of extreme inequality. And a very important implication also is that the state is still considered as the main source of patronage, which has a lot of implications for the language that we use of fragile states in this region. Um, the fact that a lot of patronage still flows from the state and from these offices. So why then does this form of, despite all of these sorts of changes, why then does this form of clientelism continue? I think a lot of our answers lie in the reproduction of bureaucratic structures and the ways in which bureaucracies deliver um, in these areas. And of course, of the fact that a lot of our politics is still mediated and is still mediated by these political parties that don't create direct constituencies, but continue to work through mediated politics and a whole host and different types of intermediaries that play a role within that. So I'll leave it, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you, Shandana, for the interesting presentation. Um, so next up, we will then have uh, our discussion Andrew McDonald to give some uh, critical perspectives. Uh, Andrew's research interests encompass the 19th and 20th century history of empires in Southeast Africa and the Indian Ocean, with a focus on migration, borderlands, and capitalism. And uh, being in the, the history department of WITS, Andrew teaches undergraduate courses on world history and empire and on the making of modern South Africa in the 19th and 20th centuries, as well as postgraduate courses on the history and archaeology of capitalism in Southern Africa and on the Indian Ocean since 1750. Thanks, Andrew. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Hi, everybody. Um, Thanks for uh, inviting me to uh, be the respondent today. Um, it's an honor to comment on this uh, 
immensely suggestive um, work. I'm going to uh, reject the uh, hegemony of PowerPoint actually this evening. Uh, I'm not, I don't have one, um, uh, but I will in the next 15 or so minutes um, offer a little bit of a summary. We'll try and pull a few different strands together of what we've heard so far today and what's in the book. Um, I'll offer some reflections. I'll try and pick out what I think are the big highlights. Uh, I think there's many of them. And then um, towards the end, I'll, I'll have a few questions which I'll throw out, which can be answered or, or just as uh, you know, fodder for further discussion. Um, so where to start? You know, uh, the book obviously brings attention to this thing we call the Indian Ocean world. Um, and it's an expansive vision in this book. Um, it's not a study just of the water or people crossing the water. It's it's not it's a study not just merely of um, you know the contingent coastlines. It goes beyond that. It goes into the hinterlands of the Indian Ocean. Um, it's not a study of the Indian Ocean in isolation from other oceanic systems like the Pacific and the Atlantic. Const these other oceanic systems are referenced, and the relationship between the Indian Ocean and those is constantly compared and contrasted. Um, so although we get detailed focus on about eight or nine countries, uh, South Africa, India, Bangladesh, Singapore, Pakistan, uh, several Gulf states, um, some countries around the Horn of Africa, China at the end, um, the book really has a lot to say uh, about almost everywhere that could be construed to be part of the Indian Ocean. Um, I think there's at least uh, a few a few paragraphs uh, on um, on every country surrounding the Indian Ocean. I couldn't think of anywhere that uh, that was that was left out. Um, and because of this, I really want to emphasize to to people who are listening in today that it's um, this this book has a rich interdisciplinarity. Um, it it has rich uh, its rich synthesis is of really good value and you know particularly for postgrads who might be who might be listening to this or thinking about this um the work really works i, I think as a as an excellent um heuristic device um for readers that might be in politics or international relations or sociology or anthropology or myself as um as a historian um so i really hope it's widely read um of course, we've we've already heard, I think, to some degree, how um, you know the work joins an in, an increasingly large body of scholarship um, that's been produced by multiple centres and chairs, um, really across the world over the last decade 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 or two. Um, that now shows beyond all doubt that the Indian Ocean world, historically and at the present, is a world of extraordinary dynamism and vitality. Um, and complexity. Um, it's emphatically no longer the um, empty, unchanging void, uh, you know, catching up or responding like the proverbial rat in the laboratory to Western initiative. This was what I kind of learned when I was an undergraduate. I'm glad it's changed. Um, we've heard from Harry how it really is um, the beating heart. Uh, the Indian Ocean is the beating heart of um, today's world with its uh, population growth, its thick migration, integration, um, economic growth, um, military activity is, is another <clears throat> another metric we can use, and of course um, the effects of climate change are all being experienced very directly. So uh, what I'd like to do is just um, pick out what I think are the uh, are three uh, significant uh, theoretical or historiographical interventions that the work makes, um, and then summarize briefly the argument of the book, um, just pull it all together as a whole, uh, and then share with you um, a couple of questions. Um, I think about three or four questions, um, which, I'll, which I'll address um, right at the end. Right, so what I pick out to be the most significant theoretical challenges, well, the first one I think we've already heard from Harry about. Um, the book really challenges the tendency in uh, at least some international relations literature um, uh, to approach the Indian Ocean world in a some superficial, maybe positivist way. Um, the traditionalist focus has often been on how um, order in the Indian Ocean has been bequeathed by Western hegemons, and that's often led to a perception of Indian Ocean world states as perhaps failed states and ripe for intervention. And I think, as Harry says in his introduction, um, we need to do more um, than uh, uh, we need to do more than think about what uh, Indian Ocean states are not. 
But beyond the challenge to the tendencies of the international relations, I think there's other challenges. And the second one I'd raise is it's a challenge to the utopianist literature and uh, the utopianist literature that's often been, uh, it's come out of literary and culturally study, cultural studies that presents the Indian Ocean world as this fluid cosmopolitan um, paradise, um, the radical counterpoint to the, the violent Atlantic world. And all of the authors in their own ways in this book argue, and, and I have to say they put it very politely, <laughs> that the main story really of the Indian Ocean is a long-term grappling with the modern nation state. Uh, I think the third major historical intervention or historiographical intervention, sorry, that the book is making um, is it challenges those ideas which uh, are quite widespread in history and political science and certainly in popular discourses uh, about the 19th century um, <clears throat> that see the 19th century and see uh, the world of liberalism and liberal order as a kind of uh, caricature or a cartoon. Um, some of those uh, see uh, <clears throat> the liberal order as, uh, and I'm thinking here of Thomas Friedman and perhaps Niall Ferguson and many others, they see the liberal order as something that's universalist, an enlightening idea on a kind of unstoppable march um, to, uh, to global modernity. But then you have another kind of body of scholarship which takes the, the complete opposite view um, by you know, casting 19th century liberalism as irredeemably pro-British empire and uh, racist. And I think the authors in, uh, in, uh, in Beyond the Liberal Order um, reject both of those teleologies. Um, tedious teleologies even. Uh, and I think the book works really well at showing how, um, well, the truth is much less predictable. Um, the liberal order is something that's historically evolving, it's contingent, um, it's full of nuances uh, and um, hybrid manifestations. Uh, so to do this work, as we've already heard um, the, uh, from Harry uh, in his opening remarks, um, the book conducts a wide investigation of um, liberal order. Um, I'm not going to define it. I think everyone here today knows what the liberal order is. But um, <clears throat> uh, the book is really about tracing how the liberal order evolved over time and space in the Indian Ocean world. Um, in other words, it's about what happened to ideas of liberal order that emerged in the Atlantic world, what happened to them when they encountered the societies of the Indian Ocean world. Um, it's a book about how the liberal order has been understood and engaged with and how it's changed form in the process of that encounter. And you're paging through the book, flipping through the book, one finds all kinds of synonyms that, uh, syn uh, synony synonyms that get, get this basic uh, message across. You know, we're, Chapters look at how the liberal order has been mediated and appropriated, resisted, refracted, constructed, um, perceived, subverted. I could go on and on and on. I think the thesaurus has had a good workout here. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, the argument of the book um, to sort of pull all the different strands together uh, is that the driving concept of the argument is the notion of thin hegemony. That is to say that liberal order has neither been fully present nor fully absent in the Indian Ocean world. Um, and it's true even of the pre-liberal Indian Ocean world, um, that the, the pre-liberal, pre-modern Indian Ocean world was a, an oceanic frontier, um, a world of autonomous groups, very loosely held together by Islam, but Islam was itself, of course, divided, um, but also prone to disintegration into different subsystems, um, prone to violence and coercion of different kinds. Um, we have some interesting remarks on slavery, and piracy, and communal violence um, that predate, uh, predate the liberal order of the 19th century. Um, thin hegemony also characterizes the, the, the Pax Britannica of the uh, later 18th and long 19th century, um, despite British claims to hegemony over the Indian Ocean world, uh, it wasn't very clear. There was no regular hegemony at play. Um, and of course, Thomas uh, explains this best in his chapter, which is the most historical of them. Um, really, I think I think uh, Thomas is really, um, you know, he's challenging Foucault and, and, uh, and others and uh, uh, Boss as well, is challenging the idea that the 19th century is a story of the, the unitary expansion of a kind of monolithic, modern, rational biopower. Instead, when we encounter the Indian Ocean world in the 19th century, 
it's really a system of distributed sovereignty as um as Thomas has explained. So just to really sum it up, it's it's the idea that you know <clears throat> empire works through a patchwork of sovereignty, some liberal, most not, um, based on a on a theatric of a theatrics of rule um, uh, to ensure sovereignty over people, but not so much over borders or territory. So in the 19th century, imperial authority was often distributed or diluted or bifurcated through treaties and agreements with, with sheikhs, with princes, with chiefs, uh, religious and customary authorities of different kinds, trading diasporas, also important. Um, I guess it's what Southern Africanists would call um, uh, Shepstonian indirect rule and its, uh, and its later iterations. Um, and this uh, distributed sovereignty is really, con Bohansen is really, and it's really constitutive of imperial power. Um, it's constitutive of the liberal order. It's not a kind of afterthought or a footnote to it. Um, the so-called liberal order rested often on illiberal and archaic and sometimes even atavistic orders in order to, to function. Um, <clears throat> thin hegemony remains the overriding theme of the Pax Americana too in the post-war world, um, the second world war, in case you're wondering. Um, you know, the second half of the 20th century and the first decades of the 21st, uh, you know, they've been characterized by a kind of an oscillation between thick and thin hegemony, to use a, you know, to use the kind of soupy metaphor. <laughs> um, and it's rather more thin than thick. So we know that, you know, the US and the second half of the 20th century embarked on many economic and political, military and developmental initiatives um, uh, to, you know, to prevent conflicts, to guarantee secure American security, to spread prosperity, to export representative democracy. This has given rise to a kind of orthodoxy or a conceit in diplomatic as much as scholarly circles that US-led interventions in the Indian Ocean world um, have established a kind of embedded liberalism or a liberal ascendancy. But as this book shows, it's actually been rather limited in practice. It's been much more ad hoc. It's often scaled back and critically often dependent on illiberal elites. Now, the thin hegemony of the Pax Britannica and the Pax Americana uh, has led to today a world of extraordinary diversity or pluriformity, as it's mentioned. Um, there's an extraordinary diversity of kinds and of orders and of forms um, of, sovereignty, of uh, sovereignty that take some aspects of liberal order, but then mix it with older forms or mix it with illiberal forms. So I think what, what's been happening is really in the Indian Ocean world, a kind of decoupling of uh, industrial economy, capitalist economy from liberal politics. And that relationship, which has so often been seen as interdependent, one needs the other, is decoupled, no longer the case. Um, so what does this diversity look like today? Well, we see the diversity in, you know, we can go back to the 1950s and 60s and look at the the, the Afro-Asian imaginaries, the new regionalisms that are associated with the Bandung Conference and the Non-Aligned Movement. These borrowed some basic notions of self-determination and cooperation from the liberal order, but went on to create something quite different. We can also see diversity in those states which, which were founded by liberal anti-imperialists, but which also drew up the bridges to become much more introspective. Some introspective, uh, some would, turn into communist states, um, but they're always with a complex relationship with uh, Moscow. And in this volume, we see how states are on the Horn of Africa. So Somalia, Eritrea, Ethiopia, um, used in liberal notions of self-determination to partition the region, but then to shore up very illiberal regimes. So it's a kind of a paradox there. Um, we also see in the books, uh, in, in the book, in the chapters, I should say, um, many examples where liberal doctrines are, you know, in practice, little more than, than superficial developmental fads or fashions. Um, we see it in Somalia, we see it in Bangladesh, um, in which this plays out particularly in women's lives, in women's bodies. And we see it in uh, Bombay with the, the layered, frag fragmented sovereignties that uh, Thomas has spoken about. And uh, extremely interesting section, the middle sections of the book also uh, take us on a journey through states that are based on a kind of pragmatic, pragmatic or selective borrowing 
of the liberal and the illiberal. Uh, we see it in Singapore, which combined the mercantile cosmopolitan of the liberal empire with American multinational co uh, corporations, with social democracy and state capitalism, strange bedfellows, but which kind of, at least in material terms, seems to have uh, worked. You can think of that as a kind of efficient authoritarianism. We also see it in the Gulf states, which have embraced liberal principles in some areas like finance and education and trade en uh, enclaves, while at the same time maintaining uh, Sharia law in areas like citizenship, housing, labor regulation. We've also seen how in, um, in Pakistan, uh, <clears throat> electoral systems and democratic accountability operates alongside, next to, with, in tandem with the patrimonialism and clientelism of big men. It's, it's an uneasy, but, but it's not altogether unstable relation, as we've heard, it opens up space for political par uh, participation among marginalized groups. Um, and we also see, I think, in the book, uh, states uh, that uh, are, are able to combine, in a strange mix, liberal capitalism, religion and authoritarianism. And these, you know, these, this happens in ways that are, are quite unsettling to champions of the liberal order, to conventional definitions of the liberal order. So India is a good example of that. Thailand is mentioned, there's not a chapter on Thailand particularly, but it's, a, it's an important part of one of the later discussions. Anyway, the point is, of course, that emerges from this book is that none of these diverse kinds of states are hegemonic. Rather, the Indian Ocean world is characterized by a great heterogeneity of forms, um, a suppleness, um, a diversity. Right, so that, um, I think, uh, hopefully uh, sort of conveys the, uh, uh, the uh, historiographical interventions of the work and summarizes, pulls together some of the things that we've, we've heard about in, in a little bit more detail in the presentations that have come. Let me just end off, I guess, with a few, um, a few questions, um, uh, maybe just to stimulate some, uh, some, some debate or some, some conversation. Um, let me start off with the obvious one. Um, this book went to press uh, in 2021, I guess, by the middle of 2021, somewhere around there. Um, 2022 has been um, a big year in world history, right? We've had the uh, the culmination, hopefully the end of the pandemic. Um, we've also had a war in, um, in Ukraine. We've had particularly devastating droughts and floods, of course. Um, one actually wonders what plague is awaiting us next. But anyway, the question is, um, how might um, these issues, which I really think are of profound consequence, how might things like the pandemic and the war in Ukraine, um, <clears throat> climate catastrophes affect the general arguments put forward? How might it affect the general development of order in the Indian Ocean world? Um, I suspect, you know, you can really, you can, it'll support your arguments in general, but I'm just not 100% sure how. Um, second question, um, for the most part, um, and I'm glossing a bit here, but for the most part, uh, the book focuses on state actors, on public actors, on um, elites, uh, whose actions and ideas are, again, generally speaking, uh, easily accessible. They provide a legible record to policies, and statements, and so on. Uh, now, they might embrace the liberal order very weakly, of course, um, but most of these actors still talk in a register that is broadly recognizable or intelligible to other state actors. So I was wondering, in light of this, a couple of things, uh, two or three things. One, um, is it possible to identify and therefore say more about other notions of political order or belonging or of economy that might be hidden in the language of um, the religious ecu or in lost intellectual traditions or in cosmopolitan uh, cosmologies, local cosmologies that exist um, beneath the level of the explicitly um, political. Or conversely, are we basically stuck with the tools and the concepts of the nation state, whether liberal or illiberal? Similarly, how powerful are um, shadow interests um, in, um, <clears throat> in in affecting change across the Indian Ocean world. By shadow interests, I mean groups and sections of society that exist for no political program in particular, um, in uh, but seek out to accumulate wealth through illicit networks and 
corruption. As you can imagine, this is a big, a big story in South Africa these days. So I'm interested to the degree to which um, more clandestine uh, actors uh, shape um, political developments and international relations across the uh, Indian Ocean world. Um, and then uh, last point, uh, I think for now, I do have a couple of other ones, but uh, I'll run out of time. Uh, it's really just a methodological question. Uh, and I wondered about language. So, uh, and not the language that's used in, in the book, it, it flows, I have to say, it's very well written. Um, it, it does that rare thing of, you know, every chapter is engaging, it's not lost in jargon, it's, uh, you know, perfectly intelligible to, to, to anybody, whatever their background as they come to. But what I am <clears throat> interested in is, or want to ask about, is um, translation. Um, the Indian Ocean world is, of course, multilingual. Uh, intensely multilingual uh, and I'm interested I guess I'm, I'm, I'm thinking concepts like liberal order um, thin hegemony thick hegemony these are things that as scholars we use as our analytical categories but it's not always that clear to me how they translate into other languages or conversely how you discuss political uh, forms um, in multiple languages and translate them back into English. So I just wondered if you could reflect a little bit on whether there are concepts, uh, whether there is a little bit of, uh, there's a little bit of attention in, in, or a little, a little bit of selection and decision-making in how, when you do your various research, how you interpret certain words and whether they are easily translatable into, um, into the commonplace words that we, that we would find in this, in this book. Um, yeah, I mean, that's it for now, I think, um, again, uh, Thank you very, very much. Um, I've really enjoyed it. Um, it's definitely going on to some reading lists. Thank you. Thanks so much, Andrew. Very, very generous uh, with your with your comments and your feedback. I'm going to perhaps first hand it over to Thomas because I know he has to run to a different meeting. So Thomas, maybe you can share whatever thoughts you have in, in response to Andrew's uh, poignant questions. And then Shandon and I can, can, can take it further uh, later. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, these were great comments, and I, I'm glad you you sort of got it uh, in a sense. Got the, the uh, very precisely, I think, captured what is the uh, the the main some of the main um, conversations we had that were. And I was at, it's it's very interesting process. I think, and Harry can maybe say more about this. Um, that when we got together in a couple of meetings and all that, it was as if you know there was a kind of convergence of, of point of view. It was not. You know, we, we all, this, what you see coming through the book, this sort of what you call between these two, uh, you know, um, uh, a strongly kind of uh, pro-liberal order uh, uh, kind of uh, point of view, uh, and, and on the other hand, a strongly sort of anti-imperialist uh, 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 rhetoric. We were sort of in between, and we were all interested in teasing apart what, what were actually the complexities that that we saw in the Indian Ocean world um, in, a, in a deeper sense. Um, I, I want to respond just to two things. You, uh, first, the, uh, I mean, the, the, the one question you raised about what, what gets left out uh, on the focus on, on elites. So I have a few remarks about that and then also the question of translation. So, uh, I mean, I, not, not, certainly in, in my work, I, I haven't really focused that much on elites, but you can see there are other things that slip out of um, that uh, uh, slip out of view if you focus on state agents or nation state perspectives, of course. And one of the most obvious that I address in my chapter, but I think it's also it comes across in other um, in other chapters in the book. It really um, uh, these networks that I traced and uh, I encountered uh, in South Africa and also in India. We have this kind of circulation of people. I, I looked at the Memons, but also other uh, mainly Gujarati-based uh, Muslims. This sort of circulation of of um, both scholars and businessmen and uh, people seeking brides for their sons uh, uh, back in Gujarat or whatever. This is something that's been going on for generations, uh, and, and it still goes on. And and, and you have. Um, uh, and people go to Pakistan sometimes, so there's a whole interesting <laughs> way in which the South African Muslim community were, certainly at the time when I was doing my work in the uh, late 90s, were approached both by the Indian 
uh, authority, uh, Indian consulate and and the Pakistani consulate and, and embassies trying to sweet talk them and say, hey, but you uh, you belong to us, don't you? Uh, and they were like many of them were kind of uh, hardcore, um, pretty orthodox Muslims. Said, no, no, we 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 believe that we are more Arab. Actually, we enjoy going to Mecca and Medina a lot more than going to La to Karachi and Bombay, which is untrue, by the way, uh, because that's where they went for, to do all their shopping and and all that. And everybody went to Dubai. But anyway, um, so, so there is a kind of long-standing networks that are meshing both um, trade and, and religious interest and religious discourse uh, uh, preachers. And it's very interesting. What I saw was that after 94 in South Africa, you could see lots of Hindu um, groupings that had not been able to do this in quite the same way and most of the Indians in South Africa are of Hindu background started to do something like that to build out relationships with India and trying to do this uh, and in some ways emulate what the Muslims had been doing for a long time now this is these are things that fly way under the radar of most nation states and yet not I'll give you one example mm. in the in the late 90s the the Indian government had decided that as part of its kind of uh, a, a, a great power strategy they wanted to reach out and try to recruit and and uh, and align themselves with the often very successful Indian communities across the world. They were, of course, mostly interested in people in the UK uh, and the US and Canada, but they also tried other parts. So they they issued a um, a card, something called the, the People of a PIO People of Indian Origin card that you could uh, acquire, and it'll give you you didn't have to have a visa. You could go back and forth and all that. So the Indian um, government tried to do this and tried to recruit uh, interest in this. And, and I was witness to some of these meetings and I was part of this. And you could see in South Africa uh, among uh, people there a sort of, you know, this is where in a sense a, 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 a diasporic community that has been at long, for a long time playing it very safe and, and, and feeling very uh, uncertain about its place in, in South Africa were very, they were very divided on how to approach this, right? Because they, they sensed that this was a, a path that could be both dangerous, but also advantageous in various ways. So I think there's a whole, I mean, there's a lot of stories there I, I have written about elsewhere, um, where, where I think the, the Indian Ocean is a space of imagination, of hope, of dreams, of, of connecting with the world that's of our ancestors. At the same time, a great deal of a sense of, of, you know, this is also a world that is maybe in the in the, in the age of nation states and hard borders, uh, that that were older world that belonged to a world of empire where movement was perhaps differently coded and differently charged and and maybe more heroic in some ways. Uh, it, it had now become a perilous thing, right? Something that was fraught with risk uh, and and uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, uh, there was a certain North Indian family that came to South Africa uh, later after I'd done my work and invested heavily in the friendship with the former president. And that, that of course, poisoned the well even more for lots of people. Um, so, so that's one thing. Just with translation, I think there are lots of concepts that are traveling back and forth. Um, English is one of the languages, uh, but I think in certainly in the world that I have dealt with, uh, the languages that are, uh, if you if you spend time in, in the Persian Gulf around uh, that area, that yes, the, the Arabic is, is a language, but actually Gujarati and Hindi, are, uh, Hindi Urdu are, are major languages, right? Which is, and it's, this is not a new thing. People say, oh yeah, this is because of all these people who come over as labor migrants, no. It's a very, very old thing. And it's not just that, um, that a lot of the, uh, what some, some people have sometimes called vernacular capitalism or vernacular capital, what I mentioned in, in my chapter, the, the, the capital groups, including the, the, the family, uh, India's richest man, uh, second richest man who is sponsoring the professorship that I sit in at Stanford University. Now that family's wealth began by a young man from impoverished circumstances from Porbanda going over to Aden in Yemen and starting a business. And this is where the family fortune began, right? Now, this is a very old story. So the story of kind of, you can say, um, accumulation, both Gujarati and other traders uh, uh, of non-colonial, non-European uh, trading houses, whatever. These were founded on 
the pathways and the possibilities and the markets that opened up uh, under this thin hegemony. Um, and the Indian Ocean is, is thickly sort of woven into this story of the rise of indigenous capitalism uh, across the whole space, right? And we have to look at that. We have to understand that what this is. And this is, uh, does that fly? Is that a form, is that a form of um, translation? Yes, it is. Uh, <laughs> it's a form of exploration, a form of trade uh, that, 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 that also moves with the times and now sits, of course, uh, in alliance with uh, powerful nation states. But the origin of all of this is the Indian Ocean. Thank you. Stop there. Thanks very much, Thomas. Yeah, great, Thomas. Let me perhaps build on some of what, what, what Thomas has very richly explained here um, and, and perhaps connect this point about in the process of the writing of the book with, um, with your question, Andrew, the very first one about, you know, what the recent geopolitical developments may or may not mean for the arguments of the book and, and the way we think about it. Um, now, because this was a fairly drawn out process indeed, and, and it was drawn out in part on, on purpose to give ourselves time as a group, as a collective, to get our heads around very specific, very broad historical and theoretical questions with, with hopefully deep local specificity, where the kind of specificity that Thomas is interested in, these kind of networks of, of circulation across time and space, or the kind of um, highly uh, specific work that, that Shandon has been doing um, in villages in the Pakistani Punjab and trying to uh, see what that may teach us about practices of democracy and democratization elsewhere, we thought it was important, first of all, to take our time and therefore also to allow, uh, so to speak, different political events around the world to, to affect us and affect our thinking. I mean, the period of, of work is indeed, we started on this in 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019. These are years indeed in which there was an incredible amount of conversation about the future of liberal order, not just because of Brexit and Trump, but also, for example, because of Daesh. And the idea of, of a, jihad, a jihadist caliphate, a very different universalist proposition, but nonetheless an important one. Of course, a lot of talk also about intensifying Cold War with China and whether that fundamentally challenges any of the of our understandings of international order. And so what I would say in response to your 2022 question is that you know, maybe the, the various forms of uncertainty um, that come with pandemics, with climatic changes, with rising geopolitical tensions point to the usefulness of this tradition, historically rooted as it is, of thin hegemony. That is to say, to find ways of toleration and of coexistence between very different cultural, political, economic traditions and systems, in which, yes, at certain moments in time, there is a primus inter pares who tries to um, make certain things a bit, a bit thicker, a bit more consequential, um, but nonetheless, there in which there's a fair amount of, of give and take, and that there is kind of value, if you like, to a, sometimes a, a lowest common denominator system at an international level is really something that shouldn't be, shouldn't be underestimated. Um, now, of course, in the space of the Indian Ocean world, contrary to that, for example, of the Pacific and the North Atlantic, it is embedded in these histories and these cultural understandings, which crucially inform the way, therefore, people perceive um, uh, of one another, of different states, of different regions, etc. Um, not having the sa that same kind of cultural and historical baggage makes it very difficult to export as if you like, or for other parts of the world to, to copy it. But nonetheless, I'd like to think um, that the enduring power of, of that diversity in that sense has, a, if you like, a kind of positive takeaway for those concerned with, with questions of international peace and security in particular, but international cooperation more, more broadly at this moment in time. Now, the other thing I think it's worth something a, a little bit more about is, is, as you said, you know, the, the importance of the nation state and the degree to which the nation state challenges the kind of histories, the kind of imaginaries that, again, Thomas underlines so powerfully in his work. Um, and I think it very much does. I mean, there is an ongoing struggle uh, in places like India, of course, on the Narendra Modi, but also in the UAE, for example, which is its own very specific attempt at creating a kind of Gulf nation state with a military draft, with a national curriculum that in many ways tries to replicate some of the things we saw in late 19th century and early 20th century Europe. Um, some of what is happening in Southeast Asia is also trying to, to resemble that or trying to mimic that. And I think that, that that's interesting and, 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 and intellectually uh, greatly challenging, um, exactly because it tries to shed some of the the pluriformity and some of the traditions of the of the Indian Ocean world that have been such a resource for many of these societies, but which 
power holders for various reasons are profoundly skeptical of. Um, and this one, of course, raises the question, um, who will win out? You know, is it, is it, are we living in such a different technological and political era that yes, um, these kind of would-be nation uh, builders can indeed steamroll and crush uh, some of the opposition to them in a similar fashion that happened, for example, in, in France in, in, in the 19th and 20th century? Or uh, will these legacies um, of not only liberal order, but different types of order continue to, uh, if you like, militate and, 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 and prevent um, the, the, the success of these kind of designs? My intuition would be with the latter. Um, that despite all these these attempts by the likes of, of Narendra Modi or Mohammed bin Zayed or others, um, it will prove far tougher uh, to do so exactly because of uh, these histories of migration, the multiple identities, the multiple senses of managing different political orders at the same time. Um, um, but we will we, we will of course see what where 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 that ends up. Uh, final point I want to make very briefly on the illicit networks. Of course, this is a hugely important feature indeed of, of, of the global Indian Ocean. Um, on the one hand, because of its extensive partaking in some aspects of liberal order, of the capital mobility, of the encouragement of, of migration. Uh, this is a region where a lot has for a very long time happened under the radar and in some respects growing and increasingly so. Uh, the extent to which certain Gulf states in particular, uh, Dubai par excellence, but it goes beyond Dubai, have, have, ser have served and are serving as huge kind of offshore um, tax havens where extraordinary amounts of capital can be recycled, where people can move in and out, but it also serves as, as entrepôts, for example, for the arms trade in South Asia, in the Gulf, in the Middle East, as well as in large chunks of Africa. Um, is, of course, again, historically very recognizable for anyone familiar with, the, with this longer history of the global Indian Ocean, um, but it's, it's proving hugely consequential. Um, and again, the, the question is whether um, some uh, power holders will, will, because of the challenge posed by the sheer size and sheer scale of, of these, 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 these networks, uh, will find it important to somehow rein them in and sometimes put, put somehow, somehow put obstacles uh, to that and perhaps return to indeed a kind of more nationally defined understanding of, of sovereignty and, and, and of interactions with others. Um, or whether again, there'll be some kind of um, coexistence that is found that it ultimately proves proves beneficial to them as well. Um, again, my inclination is to to suspect the latter based on historical patterns of interaction, but uh, who knows we'll have to we'll have to meet again in in five years, ten years, and maybe in, in fifty years to uh, to resume this discussion. Yeah, great. Shamla, over to you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to speak just at the margins of this and just add very uh, little bits to this also because we're almost at time. Uh, but to just pick up on uh, and make the answer very specific to Pakistan, because I mean, you're, a lot of your questions, Andrew, and thank you for them, um, were, were essentially sort of, you know, at, at a much higher level than, than what I'm looking at in the chapter. But I did end with the sense of the need to consider what's been happening with the bureauc uh, with bureaucracies in these countries. And that lies at the uh, but sort of at the intersection of a question you asked about what else is the language of belonging in these areas, but also what is the state of the nation state. And so for Pakistan, that's a particularly important question. Um, because it still can't decide which part of this Indian Ocean world it actually lies in. And we've heard a lot about sort of the tug and pull of, of, of Muslims in South Africa. And it happens very much uh, in a country like Pakistan as well, where it still cannot decide along with the rest of the world of whether it sits in South Asia or West Asia and whether it's drawn by culture or by religion and what its international networks look like. But coming very quickly, and especially given the events of these last few uh, months in Pakistan, is I've spent the whole day today with a provincial government talking about um, crisis, uh, crisis management and disaster management and, and preparedness for the next time a climate change disaster happens, which is expected. Um, that so much of it comes down to, again, that the nature of the bureaucracy and what it's inherited and how it's reproduced that and, and what that bureaucracy is essentially meant to do and how unprepared it is for dealing with these challenges that are coming up. So even if that language and that struggle for identity may be much larger, the challenges that it's having to deal with are very much in trying to make what is now unfold. The, the nation state in whatever way it's it's considered there's a very real day-to-day -day that comes along with that 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 becomes much more central because of the challenges that we're now dealing with because there is a day-to-day -to, -day to, to 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 be resolved and so much of the chapter 
So much of what I'm trying to speak to in the chapter is trying to resolve that relationship between those, those states and their citizens um, in a way that has unfortunately come to light so tragically in this year in, in particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Um, it seems that we are out of time now. Uh, so I, I won't, uh, I won't uh, be opening up for any other questions. Uh, but I think we have covered most of the, the very important and interesting aspects of the book. Um, and in any case, it seems that, uh, you know, perhaps uh, some people are unable to join due to perhaps load shedding or uh, the late timing of, of the, the book launch here in South Africa. But nonetheless, uh, the recording will be made available on the History Workshop uh, YouTube page. Um, but yeah, let me end by saying thank you to everyone. Uh, it was a really great discussion. Uh, and I, I myself really enjoyed listening, as I'm sure everyone else did. Well, once again, thank you so much for, for organizing. And again, Andrew, thank you so much for your, for your time in the reading the book and offering your your comments both uh, both are very very appreciated great yeah I hope, I hope we can meet in person sometime soon as well so yeah carry on the discussion inshallah, inshallah. Okay. yeah <laughs> <clears throat> thanks right. everyone just joining to say congrats thank thank thanks so much much appreciated thank you <laughs> bye everyone bye everyone bye thanks everyone bye